Where are the bees, Bill? Bill is going to come up here and he's going to talk to you all about bees. Thank you, Bill, for coming. And welcome. There we go. See, you had to do the bee dance. That's what you had to do. So we, we can do the bee dance. When my daughter was in uh, preschool, I got invited to talk to all the kids about bees. And they were all, you know, four or five years old. And that was quite entertaining. How, how long can you keep the attention span of a four-year-old in preschool? So what we ended up doing is we got them all to stand up and to do a bee dance. So we got them shaking their bums and they were following everybody around and we, and that, that was exciting. So maybe that's what we need to do. We all need to get up and do a bee dance and people will show up. So yeah, so uh, thanks for having me. My name is Bill Stagg. We own and operate Sweet Acre Apiaries out in Tappan. I've been keeping bees for over 20 years now. I think I got my first nuke the end of 2001. So when my wife and I got married, we did everything backwards. So we had no idea what we were going to do, but we made the decision we we're going to do it together. So we both ended up working at a, at a farm, a produce farm. Um, if you guys who've been here for decades might remember a kind of a crazy horse farm up on Rifle Range on 20th. And they had about 50 acres of vegetables. So both my wife and I worked there. And it was that farmer who said, hey, you're into the back to the earth goat thing. You ever thought about beekeeping? So I gave him kind of a funny look and he said, well, it might suit you. I have some equipment. You can have it if you're interested. So I went and got some books on beekeeping from the library and I fell into it hook, line and sinker. So I got my first job with a com commercial beekeeper. I got my first nuke 2002. That fall, I started working for a commercial beekeeper. 2003, I went to Simon Fraser and took an advanced kind of a, a little certificate program. It's a pretty intensive little course. And then I continued to work for beekeepers in the Okanagan for several years after that. I, I tell people that was my apprenticeship. You know, you get a trade, you work in that for four years become, before you become a journeyman. So I worked for different commercial outfits in the Okanagan for four years before I started my own hives and looking after them myself. So uh, yeah, and then we started Sweet Acre Apiaries 2005. Um, I spent a number of years working for the Ministry of Agriculture uh, as a bee inspector. So I was got to become a member of CAPA, which is the Canadian Association of Professional Apiculturalists. So if I put a tie on, I become an apiculturalist. And, uh, but today I'm just a beekeeper. And if you see me at the end of, the, of a working day, then I'm just a farmer and you gotta stay a few feet away because I usually smell pretty right. Mind you, the smell of a beekeeper is much better than many other forms of agriculture out there. Um, yeah, so I've, I've loved, loved bees and we've been into it, yeah, for well over 20 years now. Um, so I worked for a number of years for guys in the Okanagan, worked for the ministry and slowly kind of built up our own operation. So since 2010, 2011, it's been full-time bees and nothing but for us. So I wanted to talk a little bit about honeybees, a little bit about native pollinators, and I hope you guys brought some questions as well. Because one thing I didn't want to do is I didn't want to sit here and stare down at a piece of paper and read to you for 35 minutes and put the mic down and walk away. Um, you know, we did a lot of, that was one of my favorite parts of working with Ministry of Ag was doing presentations. So there was a number of years where I went to just about every darn bee meeting and field day in Kelowna and Salmon Arm and Kamloops. And I did that for a number of years. And it's a good, good kind of training ground because when I first started doing those presentations, you kind of spend a lot of time in preparation and, and then you go through all of this stuff that you wanted to share with everybody and then everybody you know, those are questions that they didn't have and didn't really care to hear the answers for. And then they all leave kind of wondering what you were doing there anyway. So, um, so I'm hoping uh, that this will go on for a few minutes and then I hope you guys have some questions too. So 
Beekeeping in Canada, we'll talk about honeybees for a little bit. There's about one million colonies that are managed in Canada. Canada actually has a very strong world reputation for honey production. If you look at creamed honey, which we're all familiar with, the process of creaming honey was invented by Canadians and it's exported all over the world. So there's and, and actually, we had a, a strong influence in how the modern extractor was invented. There's, a, there's actually a handful of beekeeping stuff that came out of Canada over the years, so that's pretty neat. Um, <clears throat> now, there is about three to five million colonies that are managed down in the States. So if you consider States has ten times the population, but only keep uh, three to five times the number of bees, we actually have a pretty big beekeeping industry. So I mentioned about a million colonies in Canada. So how many colonies in BC? 20 to 30,000, and that's it. So most beekeeping in Canada is honey production in the prairies. That's the, the big, biggest slice of that pie. So there's almost 300,000 colonies that are kept just in the province of Alberta. So out of every three colonies in Canada, one of them are in Alberta. And the, the, the two big reasons for that, A is honey production, and B is pollination. And a lot of people don't think about pollination when they think about bees. Um, so in the prairies, well, we'll compare a few things. How, uh, one question I get often is how much honey a hive can produce. So that is such a difficult question to answer. So I've had years where my honey production per colony is less than 10 pounds a colony. I've had years where my honey production is over 100 pounds a colony. So you pick a number somewhere in between seven and 110. Uh, and that's in this area. So if you go to the prairie provinces, now you're talking about 20 hours of daylight in the summer you're talking about fields of alfalfa and canola, not 12 acres, 120 acres, 640 acres, 1,000 acres. So your level of bloom is just completely different. In 20 hours of daylight, those bees can just keep on working and working and working and working. So they can get honey yields of 150, 200 pounds of honey surplus each hive. If you actually look at different states and different uh, territories, all around the world, provinces. Who claims the highest honey production per colony yield in the world is Saskatchewan. They can average 250 hive, pounds a hive, 300 pounds of honey per hive. So it's quite, quite surreal to start thinking about. Uh, but what happened is Apis mellifera is what we use. for honey production in North America, and they came over with the white man. So we kind of played a little bit of a trick on the bees. We scratch each other's back. If you look at where Apis mellifera came from, they come out of the forests of Europe. So their kind of their natural time of surplus is during tree bloom, whether that be poplars and birch and alders and maples, and then cherries and apples, that's when the colony will build up its population in a feral environment. Now, when that population is built up, then they turn around and they'll swarm. After they swarm, then their only job is to get as much honey as they need to survive the winter. So what we did is we took those European honeybees and we encouraged them out of the forest a little bit, and then we put them on summer forage clover, alfalfa, rape, that blooms June, July, August. So now the colonies naturally start to build up. As a beekeeper, you try to keep swarming to a minimum so they don't swarm. So then if they don't swarm, they don't split, their population gets quite large. Then you put them on summer forage and that's where they can create those large surpluses of honey. So the job of the beekeeper is not to uh, crack the whip and steal every drop of honey from the bees. That doesn't work well for the beekeeper or the bees. Um, 
So if we treat the bees right, they look after us. So technically, bees are livestock. And, you know, I always <clears throat> tell people when we do bee courses and, 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 and the like that I remind them that honeybees are a type of livestock. And when you start keeping honeybees on your own, you're responsible for their health. Just like if you had a cat, just like if you had a dog, um, you need to keep those things healthy. So there's a lot of, you know, in the industry you'll hear the term beekeeping and bee having. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute and why that all kind of ties together. <clears throat> when I bought my first nuke of bees, so a nucleus or a nuke, colony is like a starter beehive. So everyone's quite familiar with a stack of bee boxes and what that looks like. So one stack of bee boxes is one colony. Inside there is one queen and she's brooding up and laying all those eggs and that colony is, is exactly that. It's a colony. So a nuke or a nucleus colony is like a starter beehive. So if you picture that big stack of boxes, go down to one box and then cut that box in half that is a nuke. So it comes with a laying queen, it comes with some honey, some pollen, and that queen is in there with all stages of brood, there's eggs, everything else, it's a starter beehive. So that's what we do as beekeepers in the shoe swap, is we actually focus our outfit on stock production. So we sell nukes and mated queens, and we sell a couple thousand queens and many hundred nukes. Most of them go in north, up to the north in BC, or a lot of them end up in Alberta. And we supply livestock for other beekeepers. That's the main slice of our income. Um, here in the shoe swap, it's actually a very nice area for beekeeping. We have spring forage, we have summer forage, we have fall forage. But if you're looking for large surpluses of honey, the shoe swap isn't necessarily the best place. And I mean, if we look outside, you can kind of see why. You got beautiful mountains, beautiful trees, beautiful lakes, but we don't keep mountain bees or tree bees or lake bees. We're trying to keep honey bees. So that's the difference in production, right? If you picture the prairie provinces, you can put those beehives out on thousands of acres of summer forage. We just don't get that here. Now, having said that, <clears throat> we do have a nice environment for colonies to survive and thrive. If they swarm out of, of that beehive or that bee box, that bee colony, and they'll establish themselves in trees, and they'll survive the winter in the shoe swap. They won't do that necessarily in Prince George or Edmonton or Saskatoon, but there is a healthy feral bee population in this part of BC. So when bees first came over, um, about 130, 140 years ago, they first came over to Vancouver. And when they started um, keeping bees in skeps, which is, you would see, I didn't bring any pictures of skeps, but they look different than a, a standard hive that you would see today. Um, but one of the first things they started doing down on the coast was taking rid of or getting rid of a lot of those old growth cedars, building the railway and cutting those trees down. And often what would come up after all of those trees were taken down is they would burn that area to keep the fire load low and then fireweed would come up. So you had the situation where these feral colonies that started to swarm just started exploding through the, through, through the Fraser Valley. So um, actually around the turn of the last century, last, last century, uh, the biggest beekeeper was actually a Chinese fellow in Vancouver. He was the largest beekeeper in the province. And he worked in the railway. He cut, he cut shakes and whatnot. So that's what he, and he ended up collecting beehives, collecting beehives. And he would make nukes and packages and ship them up the gold trail up into the caribou. So uh, a lot of the BC industry kind of grew up a, uh, right alongside pollination. So in your Fraser Valley, you have blueberries and raspberries, lots of things like that, a lot of tree fruit. 
and they would actually hire the beekeepers to bring bees in. Bees would pollinate those crops, and then the beekeeper was able to bring them out and take them away when the bloom was done. So like the first bees up into the Okanagan, Father Pandozi, you know where Pandozi Road is, up towards the mission, Father Pandozi was a beekeeper, and he first brought bees up into the Okanagan 1902, in that range, or 1898, a little bit earlier. 1904 is a guy named, is there anybody from Grinrod here? There's a community center in Grinrod, an old community hall. I'm not even sure if they use it anymore, but it's on a road called Emony Road. So there was honeybees on Emony Road in 1904. So there's been a long history of beekeeping in the province, but a lot of that grew up with pollination. So. When I bought my first nuke, again, a little starter beehive, I bought it off of a gentleman in Armstrong, and his name was Doug McCutcheon. And if you looked at Doug McCutcheon's bee resume, it would be very impressive. It would pretty much get him into any, any room in any apicultural meeting around the world. He's been published in some pretty fat books. He was a provincial apiarist in Saskatchewan. He was a provincial apiarist in British Columbia. He worked for a commercial outfit, and then he also kept bees on the side as he retired for many, many years selling comb honey in the North Okanagan. And he was involved in some really interesting research in the 1980s that's still looked at and read today. And when I went to pick up my first nuke, he kind of pulled me aside. He said, Bill, do you know what I've seen this year that I've never seen before? And at the time, he'd have over 40 years of beekeeping experience at, you know, very intense levels. And I thought, isn't that marvelous? Like, I don't know how many accountants get truly excited when new tax laws come out. But there's a beekeeper who's been doing this for 40 years who still had a twinkle in his eye and say, you know what I've just seen that I've never seen before? And that was one of the things that really kind of started to intrigue me. It's like, oh, you're, you're forever learning. You never have this figured out. Uh, so it's pretty neat to be involved with, with bees. And a, another thing that makes them kind of unique as well is they're not truly domesticated. They mate on the wing. Um, you can instrumentally inseminate honeybees and control their, their fam familial lines, if you're looking for specific traits. But it's a very difficult process, and commercial beekeepers generally don't do that. That's something that's kept for research programs and universities and bee labs. So they're never truly domesticated. So you're always kind of dealing with feral bees, in a sense. You know, it's not like you can, you can take a Holstein and bring it in and raise it on a small farm. We know the diet that cow needs. We know how to make it healthy for it to live a long life and to produce well. We can't do that with honeybees. A, we can't keep them in very well with fences. Uh, and we can't, minim we can't mimic what they need. There's a lot of stuff about bee nutrition that we just don't know about. So it's never truly a domesticated form of livestock. So there's lots of different types of bees that are around. And there's, oh, here we go. This is, my daughter's in Switzerland right now, so she would be very impressed with her father. I wrote a haiku. Brown bees, green bees, many. I think that's five, right? Five, seven, five. Fuzzy bees, smooth bees, plenty. Our bees make honey. So there we go. Uh, the honeybee, Apis mellifera, is the only species of bee that will really create a surplus of honey. So there is different forms of apis. Um, but they won't create surplus forms of honey. Even if you look at the different species of Apis mellifera, whether it be mellifera mellifera, mellifera ligustica, and all these different um, types of European bees, most of them will get enough honey for themselves and just stop. They won't get any more. But there's a handful of greedy European bees, and that's what we use as commercial beekeepers because they'll just keep on bringing in honey. Oh, we have enough? Let's just bring in more. Let's just bring in more. Let's just bring in more. And that's what we, we utilize. That was a little bit, yeah, you don't even need to read that. So there's a couple pictures. Um, next slide is actually a really nice picture of a honeybee. It'll be a little bit better. 
But one thing that uh, I did a little presentation a couple years ago at Buckerfields, and Tony was, was nice. She threw a thing out in the paper. Um, and I didn't have the heart to tell her afterwards, but the picture that she used was this picture here. That's a hoverfly. That's not a honeybee. So it's kind of funny, because I saw it in the paper, and I kind of smirked and thought, oh, that's fine. I got calls from two different biologists from people in Salmon Arm <laughs> saying, you do realize that that's not a honeybee. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I know. But uh, I think most people, uh, it's, it's hard to tell the difference. So I'll go to the next one here. There you go. There is one pretty girl. So they have pollen baskets right here. And when they get into that flower of a uh, apple blossom, they'll start walking around, moving around. It's, uh, it's almost similar to your elbow joint, what that pollen basket does. And all the little hairs in the leg will gather up that heavy, wet pollen. So the pollen that flies through the air in the spring, like your cotton woods and your grasses, that's not what the bees are after. The bees are after the heavy pollens that need to be physically transferred by insects. Your airborne pollens will fly around just because of the just because of the wind. So that is what a honeybee is. Um, because we're beekeepers in the local area, we often get calls of there's a swarm of bees on my deck or in my the eaves of my house. And oftentimes they are honeybees, and oftentimes they're not. <laughs> So it's always nice to, uh, to be able to recognize what we're talking about. So a little bit about native pollinators. Um, I guess I sped through a couple of those slides. But there's a lot of different bees that are out there doing a lot of good things. And one of the questions that beekeepers often get is does having honeybees have any detrimental impact on native pollinators? And the answer is no. Um, and there was actually a, a gentleman, his name is Ron Mishka. And he's outside of Calgary and he did a lot of, uh, he's got a really neat, talk about bee resumes. He's had quite the bee adventure in his life too. He's written a few different books. Um, probably his most famous book within the beekeeping circles is called Bad Beekeeping. Uh, but it was a, uh, it's well sought after. Um, he actually worked with the University of Alberta and started following and looking at native pollinator populations and honeybee populations and really delved into this question. Because for a long time, uh, we didn't really have a pr proper answer for that. You'd get if there was a group like this, you'd get your, your honeybee beekeepers on this side, and then you'd get your native pollinators on this side, and they have differing opinions about uh, certain things, which is kind of interesting and can be quite entertaining. But that was one of the questions that was always there, is having honeybees, does it have a detrimental impact on native pollinators? And no, not, not that we can tell, which is, which is really good. And it's nice to know that somebody's actually spent some real time and did some real research into that. Um, <clears throat> one of the big things is, you know, going back to the different bees that we have in the area, honeybees are actually quite particular and they're quite picky. So there's a lot of foods that they just won't go after. Uh, they're often chasing crops that came over with them from Europe. They're going after a lot of the tree fruit. They're going after dandelions, which were not here three, 400 years ago. They're going after alfalfa. Now, a lot of these crops came over from Europe as well. So they're not competing with native pollinators with a lot of the native bees and the plants that they're going, going after. And there's a lot of different, different things in their life cycles and what they do. Uh, a lot of the bees that we have, the native bees here, are, they're solitary bees. Um, if you have an old shed in the back, back of your farm, there's a bunch of shakes, shingles on there. When you go in the right time of year, you start to see a lot of bees coming in and out from between those shakes. Those are mason bees. And they're very good pollinators. They fly at cooler temperatures than honeybees. They stay closer to home than honeybees. They only fly a couple hundred meters. And, they, and they're less picky than honeybees. They'll pollinate a lot of crops that bees kind of turn their nose up at. So, 
um, you can have a large population of honeybees, and they're not going to they're not going to outcompete any forage source that those mason bees are interested in. So they work very well together, which is good. Um, another reason that you know we talked about bees being livestock, and there's kind of a responsibility side of it too. I think there's a lot of people that genuinely are interested in bees, and they want to help bees. So their natural, the way their brain works is that, okay, I, I want to help bees, I want to keep bees. But what they don't think about is kind of the responsibility end of it. You know, and I always tell people, it's when, when we were, <laughs> when the farmer said, oh, you're into the whole back to the earth goat thing. Um, we did have goats at the time. I didn't grow up around goats. So one of the first things I did is I got a 4-H book from the library. I thought if, if, uh, if a 4-H book is written for an eight-year-old, I have a fighting chance of understanding it. Um, but before we got the, co the goats, I knew what scours were. Intramuscular injection. You know, so you start, you start thinking about how to trim the hoof. You're, you're responsible for that. You're, you're bringing livestock into your, into your farm. You have to look after it. So there's things with honeybees that you need to be aware of. So there's an old beekeeper out in Kamloops, and he's, he passed on years ago now. His name was Campbell Jones. But he was very involved in the Kamloops beekeeping community uh, for many, many years. And he had a kind of a quote that he'd often say, take a course, join a club. If you're interested in honeybees, now of course we have the internet nowadays, but not everything on the internet is true. I'm sure that's uh, a, a, a surprise for you guys to hear. But beekeeping is very different in different areas. So it's very, very easy to find a very good beekeeping resource for Vermont, which is not entirely going to be applicable to the shoe swap. So <clears throat> that's one thing that you're going to get if you take a course locally, join a club locally, is you're going to get that local information. You know, one of the challenges you're going to have is you're going to go into a bee club and you're going to ask one question and everyone's going to answer it differently. So that can be a little bit difficult when you first join a club, is sorting through all that, but it's fun. Uh, learn about mites. And, you know, when I first got into bees, early 2000s, every meeting I went to, I thought I was in the wrong room because they never talked about honeybees. All they talked about was mites. So I'm like, this is a mite meeting, it's not a bee meeting. Um, varroa mite, so if you ever hear about honeybees and mites, and they're referring to this mite, it's called varroa. The actual name of it, which I think is hilarious, is varroa destructor. So it's a huge, huge parasite. It's visible to the human eye. So if you think about how small a honeybee is, and if you think about something that's visible to our eyes, walking around on a honeybee, it's almost the size of a small dinner plate that would be attached to us. That's how big it is. So, uh, yeah, they can do a lot of damage. And it's not just the direct parasitism the mite does, it's all of the secondary issues that comes along. So if you imagine you have an open wound on yourself, you're open for all sorts of different infections and problems. And that's what happens to the mite and the bee. Um, so the native host of that Varroa destructor is not Apis mellifera at all, it's a Apis serrana. So I don't want to go into the life cycle and the differences between the two, but the Varroa mite is the single biggest killer of honeybees around the world. It's pretty much everywhere. You might find a few pockets here and there, you don't have to deal with them, but for all intents and purposes, there's mites everywhere. Um, but one of the, the funny things is, is you know, when the mites first came over, everyone thought, well, that's, that's it. That's the end of the industry. We're done. We can't deal with this. I, I don't know. Yeah, I talked to some of the guys who have more gray hair than I do, and they have memories of keeping bees before Varroa. Um, I have no idea what those good old days were like. So I successfully keep bees in the presence of the Varroa mite. And so does everybody else out there that has a, a healthy bee farm. So the idea that we can't, or the industry is going to collapse, or 
I'm always a cap or a cup half full type of person. You know, you can tell people that if you're not optimistic, you wouldn't be in agriculture. Um, but you don't let the mite scare you away from beekeeping. There's lots of tools that you have in your tool belt to control Varroa. And so we manage all of our bees organically. Um, I have no interest in the politics behind organic labeling or anything like that. But our husbandry, their livestock, um, is simply done through organic acids and livestock, actual brood management. So there's lots of ways to do that. Uh, register your equipment. That's always a plug I try to do, and that's probably a hangover for my bee inspection days. Um, but can I mention how the mason bees will only fly a couple hundred meters from their home? That's your little native native bee that comes out of comes out of the shake shingles in your your old shed. <clears throat> Honeybees will fly several kilometers if they want to, so they can as the bee flies. They can go two, three, four kilometers if, there's, if the forage is attractive enough. So if you think about hive health, if I have a sick hive in my backyard, and if I have a neighbor two, three, four kilometers away that also has honeybees, my sick hive can have a negative impact on his colony. So when it says register equipment, <clears throat> the whole registration process came out of some major problems that the beekeeping industry was having 80, 90 years ago. So it is not there to, because somebody in Abbotsford or somebody in Victoria has some big long list of beekeepers that they want to uh, give you any grief, it's there for the benefit of the industry and for the health of the industry. So as a bee inspector, um, what I would do is if right here there's a problem with the beehive, and if I'm concerned about that disease, I can look at the registration system and I can find all the other registered equipment in that area. And then I can start making some phone calls and start sniffing that out. And more often than not, we would find the source of that infection essentially and it has nothing you know it doesn't cost the beekeeper anything and it's there for your benefit it's there for the health health of the industry so that registration is done through the province and all that information is kept in the egg office down in abbotsford um yeah so they're become a responsible beekeeper not a bee haver so i think we touched a little bit on, on that as well um when you're a beekeeper that's when you're actually taking responsibility for that. And you're gonna make mistakes. You know, I, I certainly don't wanna sit here and say you have to be an excellent beekeeper right out of the gate. You're always gonna be learning and always gonna be messing stuff up. Uh, but you're actively involved in their management. I guess that'd be a good way to look at it. Versus a bee haver, and that's the person who buys a bunch of bees and puts them in their backyard and then just watches them fly back and forth while they swarm and the mite levels climb and they get sick and diseased and collapse and then they're wondering where their big honey crop or why they don't have why they don't have any honey so there's definitely a, a, an investment when you get into beekeeping it's not cheap i mean there was a day where you could order your package of bees through a catalog and they just get shipped to you in the mail and they'd be worth a couple bucks and that's it so cheap bees actually you know, it's nice to have cheap bees, but it's actually bad for the industry as well because then there's a lot more bee havers and not beekeepers. So, you know, it was commonplace 50 years ago for orchardists in, say, the Okanagan would buy a bunch of packages, shake them into apple boxes, and then just let them go. And they would pollinate uh, the cherries and the apples, which is great, but then bees are only worth a couple bucks and the orchardists would just stop maintaining those hives. Then they get sick and then they get diseased and they start impacting the, uh, the other populations around. So <clears throat> the idea of cheap bees just doesn't exist be anymore. Um, to get started into beekeeping, there is an initial investment. But it's, it's interesting too, if you make something more expensive, then people think twice about how they maintain it and how they manage it too. So there's very few orchardists that do that anymore. Uh, you know, even 
20 years ago when I, when I got into it, you would often hear stories about pesticide damage and whatnot, and orchardists and beekeepers not necessarily being on the same page when it came to bee health. Um, but as those bees become more, more and more pricey, uh, those orchardists are paying, they're paying a, a goodly amount of money to get their crops pollinated. So they have an interest in bee health as well, just like the beekeeper does. So there's a lot of really positive relationships between the orchard community, the beekeeping community. They work quite well together. So even to get a couple hives going, I mean, it's, it's gonna be something that's gonna cost hard pressed to do it for less than a thousand bucks, 1,500, and you're getting some better equipment. Uh, compare that to uh, 40 years ago or 50 years ago, it'd be a small fraction of that. Uh, and I was talking to one beekeeper a while ago, and he's got a lot more gray hair than I do. And he said, it's a good thing. He says, yeah, it's a good thing bees are expensive. It chases away bad beekeeping. <laughs> I thought it was kind of interesting, interesting thing. And then of course, if you do make that commitment to start keeping honeybees, you're forever gonna be learning. It's an excellent adventure. You know, you, you often hear about people who have been keeping bees for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, 60 years. And there's something very special about that relationship between honeybees and humans. And it goes back many, many thousands of years. And there is something indescribable about that. You know, we, when we teach our courses, we do a beginner's bee course every, every year. We've had hundreds of people go through there over the years, and it's been really neat to see some of them kind of grow into beekeepers themselves. But it's often interesting, you know, because in that class I ask people, you know, why are they here? I'm thinking of a short little version or a short little answer to that. And it's amazing how many of them were like, well, my grandpa had bees on the farm. Or they'll have some story where they encountered beekeeping or they encountered fresh honey or they were around this and it planted some seed within them and kind of grew and grew and grew over time. Uh, I had this old, somewhere in my office, this uh, cartoon. I don't know if it was done in the province or what, but it had Conrad Black. So he's big jowls and they're shaking there and he's looking kind of angry in this picture and he says, you know, I'm going to take over the business world and have a media empire and conquer the world and blah, 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 dot, dot, dot. He says, and then I'll retire and keep bees. So I thought it's really interesting because every year we run into people who had that beekeeping experience planted in them at some point in their life. And here they are decades later saying, now's the time. I want to pursue this. <clears throat> so, you know, we do... Uh, the Sorrento Farmers, we, my wife does the Sorrento Farmers Market. She's been out there for decades. It's a great little market, but uh, we often get people talking to us about bees and they're saying they want to help the bees. So one thing that I, I stress in that bee course that we do is there's a level of responsibility there. So what do you do if you don't have time to look after them or you don't have the, the money to make that investment or you can't justify that in your current situation. There's a lot of things you can do just to help the native pollination, uh, native pollinators. Um, and it can be very, very simple. I and mean, go and get a bee garden and plant some bee-friendly plants. It's not that difficult. And you're doing, a, you're doing them a huge, huge help. So one thing to think about too when you're planting a bee garden, um, is think seasonally. You know, if, if you have one plant that you like and you're gonna fill up your whole garden with that one plant, take a little bit of time and say, okay, what blooms in the spring? What blooms in the summer? What blooms in the fall? And kind of mix it up. And then you're helping so many more species of bees when you can do that. And of course, let your dandelions bloom. Uh, you'll often hear that from beekeepers. They're quite adamant about uh, people who go out and cut their dandelions too early. Let the bees at them for a bit. You'll often hear that about uh, beekeepers and hay farmers too, because they have a different idea when that alfalfa should be cut. <coughs> so there's a little bit about that. So I guess, yeah, before a little bit about what we do on our farm, you know, nukes and queens, that's our biggest source of income. That's our biggest slice of pie. So that's what we are as we're stock producers. Um, when I worked for the Ministry of Ag, 
I really did enjoy the field days and the presentations and talking to people. So we've incorporated some of that into our farm as well. So we do a beginner's beekeeping course every year. And we've had people from out of province, from Vancouver Island, as far as Prince George. Um, and yeah, we've had hundreds of people come through and do that. So it's been a really neat experience. Uh, we've often had people too ask us about helping us out and working alongside us to kind of get that more of an experience of helping. And it was always kind of a mixed bag as far as are they actually going to be helpful? <laughs> are, they, are they just going to be a nuisance? Or are they going to actually show up on time or not show up? So what we started doing is we actually started doing a working holiday. And we have a little cabin on our property. I said, well, if you want to help us, if you're serious, then you're going to pay us to do it. So we offer a working holiday. And it's been really neat. We've had people from all over the place. And they come basically on a Sunday, work from Monday to Friday. And then we'll have a barbecue on Friday. And just when we start to get to know them well, we can shake their hand and wave goodbye. And it's a wonderful experience for them too. And you know, there's, and you can do that in a fishing boat. You can do that for a lot of different types of agriculture. But I think we're one of the few people who actually offer that in the beekeeping industry. So that's been really neat. We've had nurses, engineers, doctors, dope growers, um, and everybody in between come out and, and uh, give us a hand. So that's all I really wanted to talk about. So I don't know if you guys have some questions to, I don't know what time we're at here. I mean, I can keep on talking for a while, but it's nice to uh, engage with some of you guys as well. Questions? How long does a bee live? Well, it depends on the time of year. Basically, when a, a young bee is born, they're filled with all of this they call vitil vitiligenin. It's like baby fat, if you think of that. So this baby fat gives these young little bees this hyperimmune system. And their first tasks that they do inside the hive are things like feeding the young. They look after the cells, they clean out the cells. They're, they're house cleaners. So all of their early jobs they do within the hive. They make wax. Uh, they have like um, on their abdomen, it almost looks like fish scales. It kind of moves up and down and out comes these little fish scales, which is wax. And then other bees come up with their mandibles, start chewing on the wax and mixing it with their saliva and festooning and doing this really neat process. But as soon as the bee starts to forage, so now they're starting, all those house tasks are done, they start to forage. When they start to forage, it's kind of the beginning of the end. They're physically limited by how, how many wing beats their wings can do before their wings quite literally fall apart. So they start using up that baby fat as soon as they start foraging. So in the summertime, a bee's life will be four weeks, five weeks, and that's it. They basically work themselves to death. But it's a different story in the fall and in the winter because the bees don't forage. So the honeybees hang on to all that baby fat and they hang on to that hyperimmune system and they can stay alive inside that beehive four months, five months, six months long before that baby fat really starts to run out and they start to pass off. So, and then a queen honeybee, go into the biology a little bit. When a larva, an egg first hatches, this young larva has this hyper diet called royal jelly. And it's produced by these brood, brood food glands on the heads of young bees, hypopharyngeal glands, I believe they're called. <laughs> So it produces this royal jelly, and that's what's fed to that young larva. So every larva in the beehive gets that kind of intensely rich diet for the first 24, 36 hours. And then that diet starts to taper off. And then that bee, when it gets capped, if it's been fertilized, it hatches into a female worker bee. So that's what that bee hatches into. Now, if they're raising a queen bee, she's a fully developed female. All the worker bees in a beehive are female. 
the whole workforce. They're, they're, a beehive will have 30, 40, 50,000 bees, honeybees, and almost all of them will be female. The drone population is only three, four, five hundred. And that's, that's all they really need. So the queen, when they're raising that queen, gets fed that intense diet of royal jelly right up until the day she's capped. So she'll get that diet for six, six and a half days before she gets capped over. So she develops into a full, into a complete female. So that queen, she can live for three, four, even five years, which is quite impressive. But she doesn't forage either. She'll go out and do all of her mating flights before she starts laying. So she'll actually collect semen from a whole bunch of different drones and she mixes it all together in her spermatheca. And then she'll go into a cell, she'll stick her head in a cell, measures that cell with her front little four legs, and she'll make a decision if she's gonna lay a fertilized egg or an unfertilized egg, it's a process called parthogenesis. So depending on the width of that cell, she'll decide if she wants to lay an unfertilized egg or a fertilized egg. And then she will make that decision on passing semen and fertilizing that egg that's laid. And then that will become your female bee. If she wants to raise a drone, she will lay an unfertilized egg. She'll hang on to that in, in the spermatheca. And then that unfertilized egg becomes a male bee. So she's kind of a clone of her mother. So it's kind of interesting how all that works. So that answers your question, Nick, I hope. So. And then some. <laughs> and then some. You know, it's one of those things too where it's like, yeah, I start talking about beekeeping, that's fine, but sometimes knowing when to stop, that's the challenge. But uh, any other questions? Three, two, one. Oh, Nick's got another question. What about bears? What about bears? Well, you know, I mentioned that uh, beekeepers and hay farmers have different ideas when the hay should be cut. I think beekeepers and the general population have different opinions on what should be done with bears who start snooping around. Um, yeah, well, let's, you know, BC stands for a couple things, right? Bring cash. N another one is bear country. So if you're gonna keep honeybees, you're gonna have to know how to deal with bears. Um, they don't like electric fences. <clears throat> so pretty much every yard I have is electrified. And you gotta keep an eye on those things. Um, now, if you gotta, you gotta remember too, like, if you or I get electrocuted, we can kind of connect the dots as far as, oh, okay, that's electricity, that's bad, okay, that didn't feel good, I'm gonna avoid that. But if you're a bear, and if you touch that on your wet nose, that's like lightning from the hand of God or something, you have no reference at all. Um, so most of the energizers I have, you know, if you have a couple old mares that are trained and know what an electric fence is, you can have a little energizer snap in a few thousand volts. It's not a big deal. The horses are gonna pay attention to it and that's it. But there's a difference between livestock, keeping livestock in versus keeping predators out. There's a big difference there. So what I wanna see on my energizers is kind of a minimum 6,000 volts. If my energizer's not putting off 6,000 volts, I want to figure out why. I got some energizers that put out 9 and 10,000 volts. So that's enough to keep a bear away. Um, but bears are very, very smart critters too. You know, if they get touched on the nose, 10,000 volts through their body and they're going to stay away. Um, so, but I've experienced bears digging holes underneath fences and going underneath. I had a friend who had a, pal a stack of pallets outside of his bee yard. So the bear went over there, picked up the pallet, threw it on the fence, went, picked up another pallet, threw it on the fence. And he took that big stack of pallets, threw, threw them all on the fence and then just walked right into the bee yard. Um, I know another instance where a bear went up a tree and then cross a big branch and down into a bee yard. And I've heard of that happening with vineyards too. So bears are smart. Uh, what, the, what the challenge is, if the bear gets in, how does he get out? 
and they can, they can do a whole lot of damage. One kind of misnomer about bears, especially in the fall, when they start to get more aggressive, they'll start to, to fill up their bellies. They're not actually after the honey. So that's kind of a, a lie that Winnie the Pooh has told us. Um, I've actually seen bears and what they'll do is they'll push over. You know, you have your, your honeybee colony and you have a bunch of honey boxes on top and that's that surplus that the beekeeper hopes he can harvest. What a smart bear who's done this before, what that bear is going to do is run up, push that stack over, and go right into the brood boxes where the queen is laying the brood, the baby bees. And that's what the bear is after. He's after the protein, not after all the honey. So the bears are after the grubs. So if a bear went through a beehive a couple times, they learn really quick, quick where the most valuable food is in that beehive and it's actually not the honey it's 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 after after all the grubs and they can do incredible damage i had one friend of a friend of mine around armstrong and within a couple nights he had a, a mama bear and two cubs and they destroyed over 20 colonies in two nights i think so if you think about that colony for the beekeeper in the springtime, you know, that colony should bring in at least $1,000 worth of income for that beekeeper. Uh, to replace a beehive, you're looking at at least 500 bucks. So, I mean, to have a couple bears go in and take out 20 beehives in a couple nights, you know, that's a, that's a real hit. Not to mention, once a bear gets a taste, he's going to come back. So, with bears, you want to deter them as much as possible. And, yeah, give them a good snap on the nose and they won't come back. You hope. So, any other questions? Yeah. What use are they making of that uh, bee that got accidentally loose in Brazil? Yes, the Africanized honeybee. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's kind of interesting as we hear about Africanized bees, and we've may or may not have seen some pretty intense movies about uh, what Africanized bees can do. Um, we're fortunate up here, uh, they don't like the winter. <laughs> um, but what happened is there was actually a breeding program that started in South America and they brought um, Africanized bees into this breeding program. They're actually very prolific. They can produce large amounts of honey, surplus honey, uh, which makes them quite unique. But, so they, and they're also very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Re resistant to American fowl brood. So there's other bee diseases that just don't affect them as much as what those diseases affect different European stocks. But they are extremely aggressive. And uh, one day I want to work uh, Africanized hives. I haven't had that opportunity yet, but I know a lot of my friends who went down to South America and, and worked Africanized hives. Um, very different approach in how you handle them. And you dress up like an astronaut uh, can be, and it can be very dangerous too, working with, with Africanized bees, but it'd be a, it'd be a neat experience. Uh, one thing that Africanized bees do very well is swarm. And that's how they escaped that breeding project that started in the 50s in South America as they swarmed out. Um, and they will actually outcompete European drones. I mentioned that honeybees, those virgin queens, they'll mate on the wing. So they're flying up in the sky. And as they're flying, they're quite literally being chased. You'll, you'll hear it termed as a drone comet. So a drone, I don't, here, I'll show you. So you see the little eyes that this girl has. A male bee has these giant eyes on its head. And these giant eyes are just there to check out the girls and keep an eye out. And when they see them, they take off. And they fly as hard as they can to chase this queen down, who's forcing them to fly as fast as they can. Um, Africanized bees will actually outbreed European, the African drones will. So in populations where you have both European and African bees, your gene pool will slowly become saturated by African stock, African genetics. So in the areas of the world where they do have to deal with Africanized bees, uh, the beekeepers have programs where they're constantly monitoring the genetics within their stock. 
and making sure that they're not becoming Africanized. Uh, one thing that we're kind of fortunate we have up here is Africanized bees won't cluster in the winter. So they just won't survive in a Canadian winter. Um, but that's one of the, you know, I talked about when bees were cheap. That was before Varroa, and that was actually before African, African bees were a concern. Um, bees used to go freely up and down the border between Canada and the States. And that was stopped in the late 80s, I think 87, 88. And one of the reasons that that border was closed is because there was this growing concern of Africanized bees coming up into Canada. So it's something that the industry's always aware of, but it's not a major concern, but it's something that we're always aware of. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so I always see, you know, those movies when they spray like the little smoke and then they all fall asleep. Like, is that what, what goes on there? Depends what they're putting in their smoker. Um, you know what? Beekeepers have been using smoke uh, for thousands of years. And there's a lot of assumptions that we make about bees that we just don't quite fully know. So when you start reading about bees, there's kind of two different schools of thought on why smoke calms them down. And there's probably a little bit of truth in both. Maybe it's a option C that we don't even know yet. But we've been doing it for thousands of years. Um, <clears throat> a lot of the books will say that smoke, it makes the bees start to think, oh, fire, fire's coming. And they'll actually focus on gorging themselves with honey and filling up their, their honey stomachs. So it kind of changes their focus. And they're, and they're less worried about a beekeeper being in there, ripping that hive apart. Um, the other thing that some other books will tell you, which I kind of lean towards, but again, this is, you know, I'm, I'm thinking that I know what a, a four-winged, six-legged creature is thinking. Um, but a lot of the communication done within a beehive is done through pheromones. Now, you've got to remember, inside a beehive, it's dark, right? And when that bee is communicating a nectar source, they actually do, you know, I joked when I first came up here about a bee dance. Well, that comes from the bees doing actual bee dances inside that hive. Now, how they're performing that bee dance is actually telling the other foragers within the hive where the nectar source is. They're telling that by the angle at which they're running inside the hive coincides with the angle of the sun in the sky, the length of how much long they're running inside that colony. There's a correlation between how far from the colony that nectar source is. The vigor at which the bees are moving uh, is communicating how excited that bee is about that nectar source. And if you think about all of this communication that's going on, it's all being done in the dark. So you almost think of you know, the word chemtrails. It's like bees are running around inside, leaving all these chemtrails around. Um, but that's how they're communicating that to other, other bees within the colony. So I think by smoking the bees, you're actually dulling their ability to release different pheromones. So you are kind of keeping them calm and a little bit confused and that gives the beekeeper time to go through and to manage that colony and do what he needs to do. Uh, the bee, you know a colony, well there's a few different indicators that the, the colony will actually start to tell you when their patience is running thin. And it will actually, if you push and push and push that, it'll get to the point where you can actually, they'll start putting out venom. It smells like banana peels. So if you get to the point where you're starting to smell bee venom in that hive, you better be, <laughs> you better be done and, and wrapping things up. I mean, honeybees are docile, right? You know, and you always hear beekeepers talk about that, which they are. They're not going to be randomly getting into your Coca-Cola or harassing your hot dogs or anything like that at picnics. They're not gonna be aggressively stinging you. But you do have to remember that honeybees do have venom it's actually the type of venom, it's quite closely related to rattlesnake venom. So they say a rattlesnake snake bite is related to, is 
roughly equivalent to about 50 bee stings. So if you had 50 honeybee stings and just like that, that's equivalent to a, to a rattlesnake bite. So, and there is enough venom inside a hive to take down a horse. So just keep that in mind. <laughs> um, so again, know how you're dealing with them. You know, I, I had one guy who started bees uh, a number of years ago and he picked up his nuke, so his starter beehive. And I said, so do you have all your gear? You have your smoker, you have your veil? Oh, no, no, he says, I don't. He says, one of my neighbors, he's, uh, he's this European guy, he kept bees in the old country, and he says, I don't need either. I said, okay. <laughs> all right, a few months I ran into him. I said, so how are you doing? He said, man, I had to get a veil, I had to get a smoker. <laughs> So he went into the beehive and he just lit a big cigar and he figured having a cigar in his face was, was good enough to work through that beehive. So after a bunch of stings all over his face, he figured maybe it was a good idea to go, to get, go get a veil. Uh, but it was kind of funny. Um, so yeah, there are days, like even for us, like being a commercial beekeeper, we run upwards of 400 colonies out there. And there was several days this, this year that I went out and I spent the entire day working without my veil because you can kind of read the environment and you can read the colonies and you're taking a little bit of extra time and that's fine. But I've developed a certain skill level that allows me to make that decision. <laughs> so your first day of beekeeping, you want it to be a pleasant experience. So use a smoker and please use a bale. Um, yeah. So there we go. That is uh, I, I'm an hour in. Is there any other questions or I can bow out? So thank you guys and thanks for the invite here and uh, I recognize a few of your faces and I'm sure I'll get to know a few more of you. So thank you. Thank you.